Hello, welcome to the um, Alabama Aquarium at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab and to our Boardwalk Talks program. My name is Mendel Graber. I am one of the educators here at the lab and today we're going to chat with Meg who um, is a senior coastal scientist with Moffat and Nickel, the engineering consulting firm I will ask that you tell us a little bit about Moffat and Nickel yeah, no um, that is responsible for designing the project to add sand to the east end of Dolphin Island, that restoration project, and um, also the breakwater project that is um, at the causeway coming onto the island. So you may have, if you've driven on or off of the island, you may have seen that project underway. We've had a lot of questions about both of these projects. So. Um, Meg is going to right. tell you a little bit about her role and um, and then a little bit about these projects. All right. Just <laughs> All set. Uh, so yeah, my name is Meg. I do live here on the island, so these projects are a little closer to home when you get to work on them. So I'm a project manager for an engineering firm. I'm a scientist myself, so um, a lot of these habitat projects need to have some scientists on board. And so, um, how many of you remember what event happened in 2010 on the Gulf of Mexico? <laughs> there was a big oil spill. And because of that oil spill, Alabama got about a billion dollars to help restore habitat. And so all these projects you see are, are oil spill money, is BP money. This money, um, there were criminal settlements and there were civil penalties. The criminal penalties went to an organization called the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund. And so theirs was really environmentally focused. The Causeway Project, the East End Project, the Graveline Project, those were all funded by the Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund. And those were from the criminal penalties, uh, trying to remedy harm from injury from the oil spill. So in uh, 2000, 16 after settlement, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation commissioned an Alabama Barrier Island Restoration Assessment. And in that assessment, Corps of Engineers, the USGS, told us all the things we already knew about the island, but then pointed out all these projects that, that NIFWF should fund, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation should fund. And one of them was this project, a couple of these projects we're going to talk about today. So, um, as any of you might know, sand moves from east to west. We get all that lovely Florida sand coming this way, heading, heading towards Mississippi. And because Barrier Islands move, we have a lot of erosion, but we also like to enjoy the island. And so we want some of that sand to stay here. Um, the ship channel doesn't necessarily help the movement of sand this way. So a lot of that sand gets um, pumped and put out by the lighthouse and it doesn't get here as fast as probably some of the people that have homes on the beach would like it to, or us beach goers would like it to. So this project was really store it's about 80 acres of sediment i don't know if you've been down there right drive down to the end of the road there's a new parking lot and a new you can see the beach it's a million cubic yards of sand came right out of the bottom of the gulf about a mile and a half um southwest of the lighthouse in a beneficial use area where the core likes to put all their sand they take out a ship channel that um got pumped up onto the beach for about a mile and a half of beach, goes out about 300 feet. You would see, if you've been here three months ago, you'd see houses with their pilings in the water. You'd see the sea lab start encroaching on the sea lab property back here, start encroaching on, there's a Coast Guard property. And the really big starting to encroach on the Dolphin Island Bird Sanctuary has that lovely freshwater pond back there. And the minute you get salt water back into the bird sanctuary, we kind of ruin that whole ecosystem too. So it really had lots of goals. It was to protect. It wasn't about protecting people's houses. It was about making habitat. So I can show you some of these. If you want to see it for yourself, you can walk out on the beach. It's there. It's done. As of today, um, we're gonna plant this whole site um, at the at last week in June. We just had a call about it this morning. So if you want to come back for a little volunteer event, we're gonna plant it. Um, we'll make the contractors do the hard work, but uh, we'll let y'all do some of the easy work. And so there was a very large dune created linear dune created out here there's also these dunes that we call humpy dunes those are kind of like your primary dunes be great habitat for all of our birds and wildlife and um 
I wish I had numbers for what a million cubic yards of sand was. Do you have some kind of conversion, Brian? What's a good way to say that? I, a, I like the different ways you've described it. It's like a, a lot. A million cubic yards million, is a lot of sand. Yeah. And in fact, it's about twenty-two. It's about twenty-two million dollars worth. If you really <laughs> want to know, um, it's a lot to do that. And if you'd been here a month ago, you would have seen a big dredge, one of the largest in the industry out there. I had this cutter head that cuts down into the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. It pumps that sand up, pumps it three miles to the island, pumps it off through pipelines. It was quite a spectacle. So um, that's why it costs a lot because we're trying to bring that nice white sand back to Dolphin Island. So um, what you don't know is that took two months, but it took us three years to do all the engineering design, permitting, uh, so we've been reporting on this project, and then they pump it in two months, and you're, you know, spent three years of your life trying to put it together. But um, so that is the East End project. There's, go ahead. Before you uh, move on, what what will be planted out there? Okay, so you'll see if you go out to the beach now. Well, you probably can see some of them here. Um, we're going to put some of the native plants. You've got your sea oats, which are the iconic ones that everyone likes to take pictures of. You got your panic grass that kind of is is down. Um, what's really wonderful is we're going to put butterfly plants out there for the monarchs. Going to put some milkweed out there oh. because the monarchs are about to be listed on the Endangered Species Act. So we thought we'd just really throw the sand we, hill milkweed. Yes, there's lots of species. There's a big fight about that. I think it's tuberoso we're putting in the species. So, are um, there, so are there nurseries that mm -hmm. source these native plants? Yes, and and not to put numbers on it, but there's about a million dollars of plants going in mm -hmm. come June, because you want those plants to hold. You can see it's holding this dune together right here. You want those plants to establish as fast as possible before hurricane season, um, to really hold those together. So, um, what is the other? We had a couple other. Oh, the morning glory. You know the mm -hmm. vine you see out there that kind of holds the dunes together too. And there was one more species I can't think of right now. So a lot of the dune plants. So I know that you know that there's been an increased interest in planting native plants, not just for restoration projects like this, but um, you know homeowners might want to plant native species, and it has kind of um, it has been hard to find to source these, but um, you know yeah. I think there's a, an increase increasing market for them. Is your source local? Yes, so we set a very specific specification for that's what engineers like to write up. They actually had to get the sea oat seeds from Dolphin Island and grow them. That's why there's this lag of time between the project being built. You have to have an 18-inch plant to put in. It might not be quite that high because we really want the plants to get in, but they sourced the sea oat seeds from here and they had to take them back to their greenhouse and grow them. And sometimes we spec it has to be within 150 miles of the project site. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that's difficult too. The planters will come back because there's big, there's big nurseries in Louisiana. There's big nurseries in Florida for mm -hmm. sea oats. So sometimes we had to compromise, but there was no compromising by the engineer on the sea oats. They had to be a genotype from Dauphin Island. So they went around grabbing seeds for that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. What is the, what's the access like right now while the project is kind of, well, the plants being protected ahead of the planting yeah. and then as the plants get established. You'll see um, we are encouraging people to stay off the dunes, as always. Even when my kid just stepped off the boardwalk, I stay on the boardwalk, right, Amelia? So we keep, we keep the, we want to keep people off the dunes. You'll see signs. Sand fence is really good at deterring people from walking through the dunes, but it also helps capture sand. So you'll see a lot of sand fence out there. But if you want to walk along the beach and enjoy it along the shoreline, just fine. Just we, we ask people not to walk through the dunes. You know, the big linear dune, we're making every single one of those houses, if they want to, I can't make them, put in dune walkovers. Otherwise, don't, don't be on the dune. The dune's there to protect your homes. Please don't walk all over it. So you can see um, your boat. We want people to enjoy the beach. Just don't be in the dunes. Yeah. And when the plants come, that kind of... People don't like being in the plants either. So, so were you going to talk about a different project? Can well, we ask folks if they yeah, have they any? can ask questions about that. I was going to, sh I can show them some pictures. We have a guy that does renderings. It's really hard to think about what these projects are going to look like. You literally can walk down there and see it now. <laughs> but um, really when it's how big it is, there. when we're here at the at the Sea Lab here, 
you can see how, how big it is and how long it goes. And it's about 300 feet. I think another really important message we're going to start telling people in the coming months is the sand's going to move. It's not going to be like this for the next 20 years. Same with how we started the conversation. So uh, the sand will eat. See, they can't, they can't, we can't say, like, year 10, it'll all be gone. You, you, it's all storm dependent, wind, wave dependent, but no, we don't expect this to stay forever. But the good news is, this sand is in now in our littoral system, and that means your near shore system, and it can he it can start heading west. You'll start seeing it sticking up, um, going west, just like we did the first project they did in 2016. So, for those who aren't as familiar with the project as um, a lot of the island residents We're here. are, yeah. there is a ship channel that runs between Dauphin Island and Fort Morgan Peninsula, oh, yeah. um, and it's dredged by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And so it acts as kind of a barrier to that um, sandment, that littoral drift. So as Meg said, you know, we would naturally be getting sand from Florida and from Fort Morgan Peninsula that would move in this current over and land on Dolphin Island's beaches. But because of that ship channel, uh, that sand falls into that ship channel and then just gets picked up by dredges and moved. So we have accelerated erosion on the east end of Dolphin Island even. I mean, you would have ex accelerated erosion on a barrier island like this compared to the mainland anyway, but it's even more accelerated by the um, changes that we humans have made to this system. Yeah, and I, on a good note, I was negatively of our friends at the core, um, they are widening and deepening the ship channel this summer out on what we call the outer bar. And that's when Mobile Bay pushes out, there's a place called Outer Bar and it's very shallow and all of us want to get our Amazon. So you need the ship channel. They're making it wider and deeper so we can get bigger, bigger ships in here. They're going to put about three times the amount of sand that they just put here along that Pelican Peninsula. And you, that'll be a spectacle this summer. It'll be a huge, uh, three times so the you amount of the sand the, out on, on that peninsula that comes into the public beach. You mentioned the beneficial use that, sand. So that's the core they're contributing to. Yeah, it, but you gotta have the right permits in place. So they, they extended their permit from where we got the sand for this. That permit got extended to the Northwest. And it's right there. Out. If you guys have been out to the public beach and stood on the, on the pier that goes to doesn't go to water the landlock pier you can see that peninsula out there and so they're gonna their permit comes up i don't know about about where the end of that peninsula is right now so they're gonna put they can now you have to have, everything has to be permitted mm -hmm. so now they can put sand in there go ahead oh they're gonna put enough we call it bird island that's gonna fill that gap between that and we're gonna fill that gap. yeah they're right in the middle i don't want to quote them because they're right in the middle of designing it um but yeah it'll it's it's a little to the west. They can't do the where it is right now. It'll be a little seen as we speak right now. I don't want to move. It's a lot of sand. Well, and so for those who aren't familiar with the geography, that's a little west of this project. It's over And area. because the sand moves east to west, so that sand will go into the uh, beach systems of Dauphin Island, but not on the far east end. That this and we're going to start working with the core. Um, on sustaining these projects, we, we need, they're saying, but again, the town has to have the permits in the place and the design in place and all the landholders have to be in place. Can't just put sand on private beaches. So um, there's lots in motion right now with the right people at the core to keep sand coming to Dolphin Island. Brian, did you have a question? That's okay. He knows my number. What's really interesting, I don't know if you can see the houses. I can pass these around. But yeah, we're trying to get people to put these overs in so they can walk over it. It actually protects the dune and, uh, from people walking on it. Um, a lot of these people got a lot of land back. So I can pass these around. I'm tethered, you're tethered. It's okay. So um, the other project we're working on is the Dolphin Island Causeway. You can't miss it when you're driving to the island, right? So um, that is um, was also funded by um, the Emergency Coastal Resilience Grant, which is focused on resiliency of structures. So that's our only evacuation route on and off the island. 
And so um, that project, Turney Basin, way up by the mouth of Mobile Bay, they're going to cut the Turney Basin, put it on a, a ship called a scow, and they bring it down the ship channel, and then they're going to pump it off. You're going to see that this summer as well. Now pump it off the scow and put it behind those breakwaters. So it'll be causeway, habitat, breakwater. And all those channels you see, there's no way to get um, that many tons of rock in without digging access channels. So those will slowly erode themselves naturally and go back to the way they were. Um, but those are just axe channels to get the rock barges in. So it looked funny for a while, but I hope people are starting to see the breakwaters. So, is that are they finished putting the breakwaters in place? The northern segment's done. So between Jemison's and Bay Park is done. You'll see the southern section is in full. They have to be done at the end of May. So rocks, more rocks. Um, the lock, they were supposed to come down the Alabama River, which would have been really cool if they'd come down Mobile Bay, but there's a lock broken in so they've have, they have to bring all that rock down from Ohio rocks, if you needed to know. Wow. Uh, and that is all, hopefully, Texas. If any of you have ever been here in a tropical storm and you're trying to decide whether you should leave the island or not, there comes a point in which you can't, you can't leave. So we all try to make that decision before you can't because that causeway will be inundated or there'll be debris on it. So hopefully this project helps. And you get salt water all over your car when there's an east wind. So that project will help with that a little bit. Yes? Um, on the ship channel, yeah. the plans that I saw I had a passing lane about halfway up the There is a passing lane, yeah. Um, and they were going to be dredging that out. Is, is that, is that the... All of these phases are in, in motion. Um, I think that one, don't quote me on that, that one might be done. The turning basin is getting done. It just got let, it'll just got, they're contracting right now. Then they're going to move right here. That's 2A. And then the outer bar is C. I think those are the only three left. Oh, okay. But don't quote yeah, me on that. I that was, if it was yet to be done, if that material was going along the causeway. Well. Not that material. It was the turning basin material because it's sandier. and Because they cut, you know where Little Sand Island is at the mouth of Mobile Bay? They're cutting Little Sand Island for the turning basin. And it's sandier material because there's a reefs right beside the causeway. <laughs> So we have to put sand, we're putting a sand bench behind the breakwaters as double containment, and then they'll pump the kind of nastier, the more, what's the word, refined, muddier Muddy. sediment behind that. So there was a reason for using the turning basin sediment. And it's timing. We have to have these breakwaters, and if they're not in, the coral will be like, Meh, we'll just dump it offshore. So you got to, I mean, all these stars had to align, the permit, the... The core contracts, the core, the contractor getting under contract, getting the rocks in, and then the core bidding their project out to put behind it. It was a lot. It it's been a long six months. Yeah. We're gonna. If you ask me, I think we'll see. Um, we gotta see what our budgets are because we had to pay the core for a little bit of that material. We had to pay for the rocks. Um, we will gaps where the breakwater gaps are and we'll cut the because it's going to be and, then you, and we might make some tidal creeks um and then we'll see how much money is left for planting that kind of helps jump start it but honestly mo those marsh plants and the amount of birds that are going to be loving that dredge material i think it'll plant itself if we do run out of money for all that budget dependent that's phase three of the college project after the core does their so thing you, so you're going to put rocks now and then you're going to put sand on top of rocks well behind them them. Yeah. And then are you gonna plant it? Or yep. You... Yeah, most likely. Yeah. Have you driven across the bridge and so yeah. have you so seen if you're the rocks driving, coming in? If you're driving north, what you'll see this summer is a bunch of sediment. You hope becomes marsh and between those rocks and the causeway, there'll be a bunch of sediment, and it'll be habitat, marsh habitat, just like the other side of the causeway. It's that kind of very marshy what the fish like and the crabs like and that's what we're trying to protect it with. Months ago I heard there were plans to make pullouts along there for that change. Yeah. That's yeah, LDOT is, I don't think, was encouraging of that in there right away. I, I don't know why it got nixed in the end, but people do it anyway, so it would have been safer to <laughs> manage it, but there's weird things with highways and right-of-ways and it's not in the plan we're doing. The county might I don't think they have a plan there.
so. Is there a boat launch going in there on the south <laughs> side of that? Funny you said that. <laughs> yes, um, we had a meeting with ALDOT this, just this week, so we do have an update. That, that's an old boat ramp there. Uh, there's some right away that's theirs. They need to, someday they might have to fix the Dolphin Island Bridge, so they have a right away that they're very protective of for the bridge abutment. Um, and so, yeah, we've got a, about a 50 truck and trailer boat launch conceptually designed right now. The county, that's Mobile County, they have Go Mesa money, state Go Mesa money, ready to fund it. Uh, we just have to get over the, get the relationship with LDOT settled with our concept design and we can start constructing that. They're going to fix your side to the revetment, mm -hmm. the shoreline stabilization there. So the pier will be better. We'll have a boat ramp for all the oystermen, so Jemison's is a little less scary during oyster season. Uh, put the oyster management station there, let, let MRD, Marine Resources, run out of that site so the oystermen have a place. So LDOT, if you're not from here, you may oh, not yes, know sir. that is the Alabama Department of Transportation. Um, and so this is <laughs> why this has taken three years because they've got to um, form these partnerships um, and working relationships and get all the um, permits from a lot from of the different core, from, from core from ADEM. From, so so um, I want to ask you about the Graveline Bay restoration all right, project yeah. too. But does anybody have any other questions about the uh, about the breakwater project at the causeway before we talk about a different project? So the Graveline Bay project is um, um, near the Don Island Airport. You can see it from the airport. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of between the, the the airport property kind of juts out into the Mississippi Sound. And so this is sort of between Dolphin Island and this. Um, um, are there plans to plant out there? It is um, planted. We're going to replant yeah. it. Uh, last summer was very hot and dry, but um, with that project, it's the same funder. It's all it's all about habitat. The town had lost about 75 acres back there over the last 100 years. Mayor Collier will tell you, yeah, the whole thing was full of marsh. He remembers it from his childhood. So we knew, and it's one of the last spots where we could really um, restore marsh on the north side of Dolphin Island. So we decided to go with a design that's called marsh mounds. And for the scientists in the room, we know why edge habitat is important. Well, the edge is where all the fish and the crab like to live. So these marsh mounds are just, you, you can try to mimic nature. Sometimes it's the easiest way is just to make as much edge as possible. So those marsh mounds are really easy to design and really easy to build. So we saved the funder some money on that. And they're just little mounds. They look like little white mounds all over because it's pure sand, uh, pure Dolphin Island sand. We did plant it last summer, or when the project was done in, gosh, when did we monitor? 2022. Um, we are going to replant because we had one of the weirdest, hottest, driest summers Alabama's ever had last summer. So the, it's going to be planted again. It's out to bid. We open bids next month. They'll be out to planting next month. So that's pure, pure 60 acres of marsh habitat. It's going to be great for fishing someday. It's great for kayaking as we speak. Um, and it's just was a really cool little project. What about um, bird nesting? Oh, the birds loved it. Now, we didn't do the project for birds, but the birds loved it. Did you have a lot so, of nesting out there last summer? I can't tell you the numbers. So our, our partners at Audubon were monitoring that. It was, it was actually turns. There was a lot of turns, mm -hmm. hundreds, and I think there was like 1,200 nests on the, those northern ones. The farther they're away from predators, like foxes and uh, raccoons, uh, the better because they don't want to nest anywhere that their eggs are going to get taken. So those mounds are pretty good. We, the other problem we have is nutria. I don't know if you've seen, uh, there's this little rat from South America that, is it a rat? A big, big rat. <laughs> I, I did the size, big rat with the, with the little tails. Um, we, um, we are partners with a federal agency that's helping to, uh, because they like to planted grass and eat the roots and make all sorts of trouble. So nutria are a problem out there, but they don't bother the birds. That's the raccoons and the foxes. So. Do you have a population estimate on those nutrients? No, I'd have to ask the USDA. They did do a survey. The other part is that our partners at the National Wildlife Refuge that own Little Dolphin Island, they're going to start nutria control too because it's silly just to do it in 
one spot. So now Little Dolphin Island is going to have some nutria control and graveline. So hopefully we get the nutria populations under control because they will de tear up our marsh. Yeah. 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 So I've seen, I've seen them out there. I've been seeing, teaching with my back to the, to the tide pool, talking to a group and they point behind me what's there that is. and right behind me is swimming on swimming there. Well, some, we do a lot of monitoring of these projects we pre-monitoring what was really exciting about that site at graveline we found a giant mama i imagine some mom diamondback terrapin she was this big and it, i've never seen one in the wild they they get trapped in crab traps um be they swim and they get and they can't get out they can't breathe um, and so that has been a big demise of the diamondback terrapins, but this one was way too big to be caught in a, so we're hoping we put a lot of oyster shell out in that project. They like to nest in shelly areas, so maybe if you're all out there, we can find some terrapins. Yeah, and, yeah. and if, you know, there's a little bit of protection from the foxes and raccoons, you know, a little separation from... I don't know if they'll start populating they, they like, that area. They like to eat the, time, the it's terrapins, too. not too far too. to swim. <laughs> yeah, but, it's not too far. But, yeah, that would be good protection mm -hmm. for the terrapins, mm -hmm. too. That mama was doing okay, so maybe there was more of them out there. So what else did we do? We do a lot of monitoring. I think it's important to know that these projects all get monitored for at least three years. That's always not uh, – that's more than – you know, that's better than nothing, right? So we partner with the Dolphin and Sea Lab. Uh, we'll do drone footage for us, elevations, all the plant counts, and the funder likes to see how the projects are performing. It gives us adaptive management things because the adaptive management was, yeah, your Spartina alternate floor, or, or your, actually it was our Juncus, didn't do well last year because it was hot and dry. It's a marsh grass. Yeah, so because of that monitoring report, I could go to the funder and say, hey, will you give us another X thousand dollars to replant? So those monitoring plans are really good for adaptive management. And well, can you tell us a little bit about Moffat and Golan? Sure. Um, so I actually did my degree here at the Sea Lab about 23 years ago, 20, 23 years ago. And um, so after lots of different careers, I ended up in the private consulting world. And so our company is a, is really a coastal engineering firm. They they started. Port of Long Beach as a port. We do a lot for the ports, the Alabama Port Authority. We're trying to build them some marsh for their material. So we do a lot of port work, um, but the, it made sense that ports then got into this larger scale coastal restoration world. $26 million a day. We just finished a $150 million, 1,200 acre project in Louisiana using river sediment. So, so these guys are all coastal engineers that we work with, and uh, we help work with a lot of the, the natural side of it, making sure they know their plants and what plants should go in and what elevations so it's a it's to me it's a fun teamwork with my engineers and the scientists working so how big is so it, it has different um, we we probably have an office in every other port in the oh, country okay. and internationally we have a th about a thousand people that work from off and nickel how many in my wheel six of us oh, sometimes okay. eight if you count the inspectors but we like to grab students right us South Alabama's coastal engineering program. They're really smart. They already know the area. So it's always our connection with South Alabama or with the Sea Lab. So what uh, I mean, do you have any future projects in this area that are <sighs> Yes, I do. So built? there's one more that we're working on right now. Right beside Graveline is Aloe Bay. So when you all drive onto the island, you'll see unfortunately the wastewater treatment plants right there. That has eroded back, so it's just seawall. I mean, so we're gonna build some uh, living shorelines out in front of the wastewater treatment plant. That big pond is a new ecotourism area. You'll see a boardwalk going in soon. We're gonna protect that pond a little bit with some low crested breakwaters, put some fill back there. And then on the other side by the airport, University of South Alabama just bought up that property between the boat ramp and the airport, or the county property, so it's county USA and Town of Dolphin Island property. So we're going to do a little living shoreline out there and South Alabama is going to be able to use that as a living laboratory mm -hmm. for your students and Discovery Hall students. And so that project, if we could get the permit, will be bid out as soon as possible, hopefully next month. So you'll get built this summer if you're down for rodeo or oh. you can stand at the rodeo site and see the, but I'm not going to promise that because I don't have the permit yet. So. 
So can you describe like how you, how Moffat and Nickel comes on board with these? Does, where, what I'm going to tell you the God honest truth. I wrote all these grants. So the town had um, the, it's a real specialty sometimes to understand how to NIF with grants. And since we'd been in all the oil spill money, we really understood what the funders want. So I, I did not write the Causeway one, but the East End, the Graveline, these, the one in Alabama Bay is not oil spill money, to be honest. It's uh, GOMESA money, which is the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act money. We get royalties for having a look at those rigs out there. They send send money to the state. So that GOMESA money is really good because the governor and the commissioner just kind of run it and give it to good projects. And then we wrote a grant for NIFWIF, another NIFWIF project. It was ECRF, same as the causeway. It was to protect, protect infrastructure, protect the boat ramp. We got a little jetty coming out to protect the new boat ramp and then make some habitat. So those are two different grants, but you know, all the effort in to write the grants, the mayor likes to use us to do the engineering design mm -hmm. as well because we already have have it all together. So, so um, importantly, these are these are close to your yeah home. Close I just to had your a heart. child running around here. I can yeah, point so. and say, "Look at Mama's project. She loves it. They all love it. They want to build marsh when they grow up." We made sure we took out. There's only 50 kids at the elementary school. We had a field trip. We took all of them out. Her kids too. Yeah. Took all of them out so they could see what's in their backyard, learn about the different jobs. I saw a few boys were very excited about those big bulldozers. So, you know, it's good for them to see that stuff in their backyard, know the careers they can do and be a part of. Going back to the youth and re-nourishment, that's already along the peninsula by the golf course. Yes. And they're going to add Brian, yes. To the Pelican Peninsula, those pinch off and make a big... Yeah, so if, it, there's all sorts of coastal processes reports you can read in, but you've seen the old maps, the problem in Pirates, you can see that spits growing. It's natural, that closes, it opens. It's a 150 year cycle and you can see it on the maps that that closes down and then opens back up. And I have to hear about this 150 year cycle a lot because Dr. Douglas likes to explain it, so don't quote me on it. I'm not be like safe harbor for mm -hmm. the French, the Spanish. I don't know. You can see the maps, and then it'll close up. Yeah, that'll be a really nice wetland someday. Do you anticipate needing to do some coastal engineering to a little gap so the guano will flush out? That spit. If you on that spit right now, uh, our coastal engineers for the town were doing it, and it's. It's like 300,000 cubic yards, and we've had the POA board, can you dredge it for $3 million? Yeah, I mean, so there's some of those coastal processes we choose to control and not control. I think that's one of them where the maps have shown that that, that cycle, that 150-year cycle is coming for that spot. So. so it was before the island was hit by uh, hurricanes in, in two consecutive years, 04 and 05, we were hit by Ivan and and that that we're guessing had been an island. Some of us called it Sand Island, some of us called it Pelican Island. Um, and those storms pushed it up and kind of connected this uh, lower elevation, uninhabited barrier island, pushed it up onto Dauphin Island, so then they, it was connected as a peninsula. And before that, it, it was open between Very the open. two. Yeah, <laughs> I used to run yeah. through there. Yeah, and and now there's a peninsula that that used to be an island. So um, right now it's it's kind of a deep harbor, isn't it? People it's very use deep. it. Uh, it's very deep. We go there every weekend. Yeah, it's very deep. Um, it'll be interesting to see how knock on wood. So we're talking about that harbor being filled wood. in with sand from two different directions and then have some plant growth so that it transitions from this. Won't be quite the nice beach everyone wants at Pirates is the problem, but it, it's part of the natural cycle. So. Are you planting anything different this summer than you did last summer? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. We are. Um, this summer's going to be hot and dry. Yeah. What we found is those mounds ended up being higher elevation than we had anticipated. It's just how they built and stacked up and we didn't want the contractor to knock them down. Honestly, I just, the higher the better. So we are going to, on the top of the Dooney plants, we're going to put painted grass on top of those. Even though that's a marsh plant, it'll hold it together as it kind of 
does it sing and then anything below three feet elevation that's all the marsh plant anything below three feet elevation we're we're putting in more of that marsh plants so that's a very good question yeah so to connect that what used to be sand island with the graveline project in that was an island it was it was heavily used by nesting shorebirds so a lot of our nesting shorebirds uh nest directly on the on the ground on the sand on the beach you they can't don't see it you can't see their yeah they're like so well camouflaged it's really difficult to see them the, really difficult to see them the eggs the chicks um but when those when that island island became a peninsula it granted access to a lot of predators and um, a lot of the bird abandoned that as nesting ground so the you know I don't yeah. know how long that graveline bay area might serve as nesting ground we're not going to replant but. the northern part where all the terns nested we're not going to replant we expect that to kind of roll up on itself and merge together those mounds so we're not going to replant that we're going to leave that for the birds the smaller mounds we're going to do you know about how many acres that is above, you know, above, so above ground, about 23, the whole area is about 60. So okay. it's about 23 acres of marshy emergent. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then last but not least, which is going to be really exciting is I can't wait to see what nest on the east end. They haven't had a beach to nest down there in how many years? <laughs> mm -hmm. Two down there last year. I think we're going to have a ton. They were out last week tilling, so after you dredge, you have to till. It's exactly what it sounds like, a big tractor with a till, because the Fish and Wildlife Service makes, wants us to make sure the sand's in the right condition for nesting sea turtles. So next month, nesting should start. And Wait, how does that... Um, it loosens up the sand. Loosens it up? Okay. Compaction, yeah, it loosens it up. So down to like six inches. I mean, it's a serious till. Yeah, so it should be very loose out there right now good for your walking muscles, but hopefully really good for the sea turtles if we control the predators. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, back to the um, project where I know you said that the Corps is still working on the mm -hmm. plan, but how, I mean, could you give like a rough estimate of how long you think it'll take for the, for that harbor down south of Pirates to kind of fill in with no. I couldn't tell you um, if you're working on a 150 year schedule for some of the coastal engineer. It might it could be in the next 10 years that it mm -hmm. that it collapses. It, it'd just be wet for a while. It's not going to fill completely in with sand. It'd be a nice wetland. Just curious a about pond. that timeline. They're like some other folks could, might be. Yeah, they don't like to give that. exact dates, but if right, if yeah. you're looking at the 150 year cycle, and if we had a good storm, it's getting closer and closer. You can see it every year. Mm -hmm. So then throughout history, I, I mean, you know, the, uh, this area has been mapped going back 300 years mm -hmm. or so, mm -hmm. um, that particular area, because it was used by the French, um, you know, in the early uh, 1700s as a harbor, and they mapped it. So you can see this island, so it will connect with the... Mm -hmm. it's the um, smaller lower island it will connect with dolphin island then you'll have this um blow through where they're no longer connected so this is the this is the, the cycle. cycle that yep. Meg's talking about yep That's any other questions? but <laughs> well thanks so much for no problem. coming up with this it's good to, to work okay. to hear from the source we hear a lot of you know scuttlebutt about the project uh, we and, have very nice fact sheets online um, or email to people that want them emailed to them uh, that you can see we try to update people the causeway is a different client mobile can't do as much but and where can people find the uh the there is literally a drop down box that says projects and you can see on all the, the town on the website. town of dolphin island's website town of dolphin and island. it says projects and it's got every single one that's been done and so will you continue to do Weekly, like I have been doing, it'll probably be, and mm -hmm. then when we go to monitoring every year, we can provide an update how it's how it's moving and equilibrating. Well, Don't give me again. more work than I. No, I'm just <laughs> no. When you, you know when the volunteer thing does. So we just probably be the last week of June, and a few thousand plants. So everyone wants to come out and. 
but we got to get the contractor on board to let us to, to do it. So, but I think it's a good way to teach people about mm -hmm. the habitat, have ownership over the habitat. We let them do it at Graveline on one mound. They loved it. Well, that's our mound. We planted it. So I think it's good to get people out, but more to come, Brian, I'll get that out. But another to-do list thing. So. And thank you for the fact sheets. They are very helpful. For yeah. People. Mm hmm To catch up. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.